So we're back again with another video, and we're really sorry that we're a little late to the party on this one, but like I said before, we've been extremely busy. Oh, there's a thunderstorm coming now, too. <laughs> Which is why they're kind of grainy. It's getting dark out there, and the camera goes kind of wonky. And uh, so if you hear the wind blowing or whatever, that's what it is. We've got a thunderstorm coming, which bought us time to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did just have to do this video because this talk by Brother Splang could be an entire course study on its own, but that would literally take hours to do. And as she mentioned, we don't really have that kind of time right now. So we're just going to focus on one particular point because it raises a lot of questions regarding a certain scripture. So we're just going to cut in and, and uh, play the video here. But someone will say, no, I, I don't believe in settling out of court. I believe in justice and truth. So that brings up the question, is it wrong to settle a matter before it goes to trial? Or is it scriptural? Let's let Jesus answer that question. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. Interesting that Jesus should mention this with all the important things that Jesus taught. Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. Be quick to settle matters with your legal opponent while you are with him on the way there, so that somehow the opponent may not turn you over to the judge, and the judge to the court attendant, and you get thrown into prison. I say to you for a fact, you will certainly not come out of there until you have paid over your last small coin. Now this is interesting. Uh, Think about the Mosaic Law. Was there any provision in the Mosaic Law to throw someone in jail if he couldn't pay a debt? That wasn't the way. If he couldn't pay, he'd have to work it off. Or a family member would have to work it off. Um, so that's partially true. There were no jails, per se, in the Mosaic Law. As many things were punishable by death or by compensation, as he rightly said. And compensation for a debt was to be worked off, as he mentioned. But really, that's an oversimplification, and maybe we can get into that later. But let's just keep playing the video for now. So when Jesus talks about prison and a judge, he's obviously referring to what a Gentile judge would do. And you couldn't necessarily ex expect justice from him. Oh, it's a Gentile judge now, is it? On its face value, all you have to do is read the context a couple verses back where it talks about solving an issue with your brother. But beyond face value, it seems woefully ignorant of the social climate of the day. You know, before you go into that, is Jesus really assuming the role of giving legal counsel here? I guess we'd have to look and see if that's consistent with Jesus' actual actions in real life. Uh, let's read Luke 12, 13 through 15. Go ahead and read that. Luke 12, 13 says, Then a certain one of the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He said to him, Man, who appointed me judge or a portioner over you persons? Then he said to them, Keep your eyes open and guard against every sort of covetousness, because even when a person has an abundance... His life does not result from the things he possesses. So then he goes into an illustration, as he often does. And we can actually turn to Mark 4, 33 and 34 and read that to go along with that. So with many illustrations of that sort, he would speak the word to them as far as they were able to listen. Indeed, without an illustration, he would not speak to them, but privately to his disciples, he would explain all things. And we're reading out of the uh, reference Bible. Yeah. Just because we like the wording better than the silver sword. And we're familiar with that too. Yeah, easier to look up verses by word searches. But again, we can see here, without an illustration, he wouldn't speak to them. So in Matthew chapter five, verse 25, is Jesus giving legal counsel to his close disciples, or is he just speaking an illustration to the crowds? 
Well, the context of Matthew 25 shows that it's in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And what does Matthew 5, 1 say in this regard? When he saw the crowds, he went up into the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began teaching them, saying, So was he just talking to his close disciples there, or crowds? This may seem a little bit ambiguous, so let's just go to the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 28. 728 says, Now when Jesus finished these sayings, the effect was that the crowds were astounded at his way of teaching. So this wasn't an intimate teaching for his just his disciples. It was to the crowds, and he spoke with them illustrations all the time. So again, in Matthew 525, is Jesus giving legal counsel to his close disciples? Or is he just speaking an illustration to the crowds, as he always did? The crowds. Yeah, because if we take David Splain's view that this is legal counsel from Jesus, then we would also have to apply it the same way with Jesus' other hypothetical illustrations of how to deal with the courts. For example, Luke 18, 2 through 6. That says, In a certain city there was a certain judge that had no fear of God and had no respect for man. But there was a widow in that city, and she kept going to him, saying, See that I get justice from my adversary at law. Well, for a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Although I do not fear God or respect a man, at any rate, because of this widow's continually making me trouble, I will see that she gets justice, so that she will not keep coming and pummeling me to a finish. Then the Lord said, Hear what the judge, although unrighteous, said. So, is Jesus telling an illustration here, or is he giving specific legal counsel that we need to go to secular judges and harass them until we get a verdict that we feel supports justice? If David Splain thinks Jesus is giving legal counsel, well, as Jesus said in Luke 19.22, Out of your own mouth I judge you, wicked slave. Or as Matthew 12.36 and 37 says, I tell you that every unprofitable saying that men speak, they will render an account concerning it on judgment day. For by your words you will be declared righteous, or by your words you will be condemned. So if David Splain thinks Jesus is giving legal advice, then out of his own mouth, it's no surprise abuse victims just don't take the abuse from the organization's judges who ignore them and try to silence them and instead press them for justice in courts. But however sensible Jesus' supposed legal counsel may seem, was that really his point? In Luke 18, 1, where the account with the widow, it starts off with, Then he went on to tell them an illustration with regard to the need for them always to pray and not to give up. And then it finishes in verse 7 with, Certainly, then, shall not God cause justice to be done for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night, even though he is long-suffering toward them? So, the context shows the widow and the judge is a hypothetical scenario. Mm -hmm. No matter how legally sensible it seems, it's just an illustration of how one should plead with Jehovah for justice. You know, side note, don't try using Jesus' legal counsel with the organization thinking, this is Jehovah's organization, so they will certainly give me justice. They will just kill you by disfellowshipping you. <laughs> right. <laughs> but let's go back to Matthew 5.25 and read that again. Okay. Be about settling matters quickly with the one complaining against you at law while you are with him on the way there that somehow the complaint may not turn you over to the judge and the judge to the court attendant and you get thrown into prison. I say to you for a fact, you will certainly not come out from there until you have paid over the last coin of very little value. So, like the hypothetical illustration of the widow and the judge account of Luke, does the back context here in Matthew 5 tell us anything? Let's back up to verse 21 and read that. 
It says, you heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you must not murder. But whoever commits a murder, you will be accountable to the court of justice. Now, hold on there. What court of justice is he talking about here? This is important because David Splain is claiming Jesus is giving legal advice on how to deal with Gentile or secular courts. But the cross-reference here in verse 21, at least in the reference Bible, takes us to Deuteronomy 17.9. This deserves some unpacking as well, so let's turn there. So Deuteronomy 17, but let's back up to verse 8. You want me to read 8 and 9? Yep. In case a matter for judicial decision should be too extraordinary for you, one in which blood has been shed, in which a legal claim has been raised, or a violent deed has been committed, matters of dispute inside your gates, you must also rise and go up to the place that Jehovah your God will choose. And you must go to the priests, the Levites, and to the judge who will be acting in those days, and you must make inquiry, and they must hand down to you the word of the judicial decision. So we see here, and this is interesting because when we talk about the disfellowshipping arrangement in general, it was to be handled by the people in general. Previous to that, it even says that the witnesses uh, are the one who should start the stoning or the, the execution process. But if it was something that was difficult for them, then they had to go to the Levites, the priests, and then they would hear it. Well, we don't have Levites and priests anymore. They don't get to play that role. That's just a side point. But we can see there that this was in reference to the Mosaic Law. So let's go back to Matthew 5.21 and read that again. You heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you must not murder. But whoever commits a murder will be accountable to the court of justice. However, I say to you that everyone who continues wrathful with his brother will be accountable to the court of justice. Again, we just clarified that the count, the court of justice referred to the Mosaic Law and going before the elders. But it goes on. But whoever addresses his brother with an unspeakable word of contempt will be accountable to the Supreme Court. Whereas whoever says, you despicable fool, will be liable to the fiery Gehenna. So, if you need more proof that we aren't talking about Gentile courts there, the Supreme Court, if you go to the footnote there, at least in the reference Bible, it says Sanhedrin. Hmm. Fiery Gehenna? Well, that was the trash dump outside of Jerusalem. So, do these statements point to secular Roman courts or things having to do with Jewish law? But the main point Jesus is making is not who we are accountable to, but who we have an issue or problem with. It says there, whoever is wrathful with his brother, whoever addresses his brother with an unspeakable word of contempt, or calls him a despicable fool, empty-headed, amharet, people of the land, a side point on this one is that it boils down to calling the person incapable of understanding and intimates that you, as a religious leader, are far better fit to tell them what they need to do in their life. It's basically taking their God-given liberty to understand for themselves, which leads to the faith that they possess, and the outcome of whatever subject that they're talking about. Your faith is garbage and needs to be torn down. <laughs> exactly. The link to that video is here. Or to quote David Splane, I'm not speaking from Mount Zion here. And I need to clarify where we're getting that quote. Um, back in 2014, when everybody had the really big conventions, we went to Milwaukee. And he said that at that convention, you know, on the big screen. I've never forgotten that. But in actions, is that true? Because in actions, in heading this organization's abuses of contempt for people, it shows that he does think he's speaking from Mount Zion. After all, Brother Splain, don't you believe you are part of the channel from God to the Amharet people of the land? 
We need to listen to you, whether it seems reasonable from a human standpoint or not. Where would we be without you? <laughs> you probably recognize all these belittling and condescending organizational quotes. So Matthew 5 is addressing who we have the issue or problem with, our brother, and how we deal with it, and them, as Jesus gets into in the next verse. Read verse 23. If then you are bringing your gift to the altar, and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go away. First make your peace with your brother, and then when you have come back, offer up your gift. Once again, we see two things here. How we deal with our brother, who has a problem with us, and how it applies to law. Secular Gentile law? Or does this hypothetical situation at the altar have to do with the Mosaic law? Let's read Deuteronomy 16, 16, and 17. Ready? Yep. Three times in the year, every male of yours should appear before Jehovah your God in the place that he will choose. In the festival of the unfermented cakes, and in the festival of weeks, and in the festival of booths, and none should appear before Jehovah empty-handed. The gift of each one's hand should be in proportion to the blessing of Jehovah your God that he has given you. So we can see that the gift offering there wasn't according to the Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. So that's the backdrop of Matthew 5.25. So let's read it again now. Be about settling matters quickly with the one complaining against you at law while you are with him on the way there that somehow the complainant may not turn you over to the judge and the judge of the court attendant and you get thrown into prison. I say to you for a fact, you will certainly not come out from there until you have paid over your last coin of very little value. So here we see Jesus mentioning settling the matters with your complainant at law, who was previously mentioned, as we just read, as being your brother, so you don't end up in prison. David Splain applies this to Gentile secular law, because the Mosaic law didn't have prisons, which, as we mentioned earlier, is partially true, as there were no, quote, jails in the Mosaic law. But didn't the cities of refuge serve some of the same purposes as prisons? Well, let's go to Numbers 35.12 for that answer. And the cities must serve you as a refuge from the blood avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the assembly for judgment. And 19 through 24 as well. The avenger of blood is the one who will put the murderer to death. When he chances upon him, he himself will put him to death. And if in hatred he was pushing him, or if he has thrown at him while lying in wait, that he might die, or in enmity he has struck him with his hand that he might die, without fail the striker should be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood will put the murderer to death when he chances upon him. But if it was unexpectedly without enmity that he has pushed him or has thrown any article toward him without lying in wait, or any stone by which he could die without seeing him, or he should cause it to fall upon him, so that he died, while he was not at enmity with him, and was not seeking his injury, the assembly must then judge between the striker and the avenger of blood according to these judgments. So a manslayer fled to a city of refuge while he awaited trial, which is similar to jail without bail. Furthermore, if after trial he was deemed a murderer, he was put to death. However, if it was manslaughter or not done with malicious intent, he was sent back to the city of refuge for the rest of his life. Or he could be freed from the city of refuge if the high priest died. So there were no bars on the city of refuge, but the avenger of blood served as a prison guard to keep him there. <laughs> exactly. So how about less serious crimes, like the owing of a debt? As David Splain mentioned, they were to pay it back. How would they pay it back if they or a relative didn't have any money? Well, Exodus 22.3 tells us if they couldn't afford it, they were sold into slavery. Would you consider being a slave a form of being a prisoner? 
That's a good question. But all these technical arguments aside, let's fast forward to Jesus' day when he made those statements about prison, because a lot had changed from the Mosaic law as the religious leaders failed God's word, blended the social world around them, and added to God's word going beyond the things written, as David Splain knows all too well about. So let's look at just three examples of prisoners in Jesus' day so we can accurately understand Jesus' words about prisons. First, Matthew 14, 3 through 5. For Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him away in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of Philip, his brother. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to be having her. However, although he wanted to kill him, he feared the crowd, because they took him for a prophet. So this raises a couple questions. Was Herod a Gentile secular ruler or a ruler of the Jews? Now this can get a little confusing here, because we're talking about Herod Antipas here, the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great's the one who killed all the babies, for example, when Jesus was born. So was John reproving Herod with a Gentile Roman law or with a Mosaic law? Also, would John even bother reproving a Roman ruler with the Mosaic law? Let's have the Insight Book answer those questions. I'll pull the Insight Book up here. It was Herod Antipas' adulterous relationship with Herodias that brought reproof from John the baptizer. John could properly correct Antipas on this matter, for Antipas was nominally a Jew and professedly under the law. Antipas put John in a prison, desiring to kill him, but was afraid of the people who believed John was a prophet. So again, was John put in prison for correcting a Gentile judge with Gentile law? Or a professed Jew under the Mosaic law? Back to that Insight book quote, John could properly correct Antipas, Herod, on this matter, for Antipas was nominally a Jew and professedly under the law, the Mosaic law. Our second example, Acts 12, 1 through 5. About that particular time, Herod the king applied his hands to mistreating some of those of the congregation. He did away with James, the brother of John, by the sword. As he saw it was pleasing to the Jews, he went on to arrest Peter also. As it was, those were days of the unfermented cakes, and laying hold of him, he put him in prison, turning him over to four shifts of four soldiers, each to guard him, as he was intended to produce him for the people after the Passover. Consequently, Peter was being kept in the prison, but prayer to God for him was being carried on intensely by the congregation. So, did Herod, a Jewish ruler, have power to imprison? But someone could say Herod was a Roman pawn working within the Roman legal system. That really doesn't avoid the problems raised with David Splain's claim. But let's say for the sake of argument that that raises enough of a question in somebody's mind, that what you just mentioned, mm -hmm. that Herod wasn't really tied to the religious system of the Jews. So let's get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Because both John the baptizer and Peter's accounts speak from the perspective of the imprisoned. But our third example is insight to the other side of the religious social structure Jesus would have been talking about. So first, let's go to Acts 8.3. Saul, though, began to deal outrageously with the congregation. Invading one house after another and dragging out both men and women, he would turn them over to prison. So here we have Saul, known later as Paul, turning people over to prison. And we all know who Saul was. But how about we hear it from his own mouth, who he was, in Acts 22.1. To start this off, Paul is in Jerusalem at the end of the Passover, where he's accused by the Jews of violating Mosaic law. So he addresses the Jews in front of the Roman soldiers who are just there to basically see what the commotion's all about. So here Paul addresses the Jews. Now pay attention to what he says while keeping David Splain's claims in mind. So we're going to read 
Acts 22, 1 through 7. Men, brothers, and fathers, hear my defense to you now. Well, when they heard he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent, and he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but educated in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, instructed according to the strictness of the ancestral law, being zealous for God, just as all of you are in this day. And I persecuted this way to the death, binding and handing over to prisons both men and women, as both the high priest and the assembly of older men can bear me witness. From them I also procured letters to the brothers in Damascus, and I was on my way to bring also those who were there bound to Jerusalem to be punished. So we clearly read here that Paul, as Saul, was a religious leader and a Pharisee, and he was binding and handing over to prisons according to supposed violations of the Mosaic Law via procured letters from the high priest and older men in Jerusalem. Wow, this is pretty clear that the Jews had authority to throw people in prison at that time. But we get more. Next, we get a great account of Paul masterfully dividing the Sanhedrin on a doctrinal issue. It's a beautiful imitation of how Jesus did the exact same thing with the account of the seven brothers. But that's kind of off topic for the purpose of this video. If you want us to do a video on that, just let us know in the comments. But for now, let's just skip forward. Paul had ticked off the Sanhedrin in dividing them, so the Roman soldiers stepped in to save him. Technically, he's a Roman prisoner at this point, but he's not in jail. Right, and eventually, Paul finds himself appearing before King Agrippa. And notice what he again states in Acts 26, 4-5. Indeed, as to the manner of life from youth up that I led from the beginning among my nation, and in Jerusalem, all the Jews that have been previously acquainted with me from the first know, if they but wish to bear witness, that according to the strictest sect of our form of worship, I lived a Pharisee. So, strictest form of worship, he lived as a Pharisee. So, Paul's not some rogue renegade working against God's organization here. Let's pick up in verse 9. I, for one, really thought within myself I ought to commit many acts of opposition against the name of Jesus the Nazarene, which in fact I did in Jerusalem, and many of the holy ones I locked up in prisons, as I had received authority from the chief priests, and when they were to be executed I cast my vote against them. And by punishing them many times in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to make a recantation. And since I was extremely mad against them, I went so far as to persecuting them even in outside cities. So here Paul admits, I did in Jerusalem and many of the holy ones I locked up in prisons. As I had received authority from the chief priests and I went so far as to persecuting them even in outside cities. No, it seems pretty obvious from the scriptures that prisons were clearly in use by the religious leaders in Jesus' day. So, in Matthew 5.25, was Jesus speaking of secular Gentile judges, as David explains says? Or is it more reasonable that Jesus was using a hypothetical situation of the current religious system that people already knew of to illustrate their need to settle disputes with their brother before they attempt to futilely offer up a rejected sacrifice to God? This organization, for its part, disfellowships any brother who has a complaint against them with the label of apostate, so they can imprison them from bearing witness to any of their abuses. And they think their sacrifices are approved to God? No doubt they will say as they do in organizational accomplishments videos, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these powerful works in your name? These things it was necessary to do but not to disregard the weightier matters of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Which begs the question, we all know Jesus is our leader. Nevertheless, how could one of our superfine, all-wise leaders 
as a channel being guided by God, not receive the Holy Spirit to recall the religious social structure that Jesus spoke of that imprisoned John the baptizer, Peter, and Paul, along with, as Paul said, many others. Perhaps it's because the motive is not pure in the first place, and it's intended to cover their actions by misrepresenting the truth of what Jesus was saying. One only needs to skip down a few verses to Matthew 5, 39 and 40 to see how to apply Jesus' words. Let's read that. However, I say to you, do not resist him that is wicked, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other also to him. And if a person wants to go to court with you and get possession of your inner garment, let your outer garment also go to him. Is that how David Splane and the governing body are directing its lawyers? <laughs> Even if we aren't guilty and the person's wicked and wrong, don't just give them the 20 million they're asking for. Give them 30 million. Right. Or even 21 million. <laughs> <laughs> or are they directing the lawyers and elders, modern day scribes and Pharisees, to ignore the victims so that they have to get their own lawyers to bargain with the society and receive maybe 16 million, leaving them with 8 million maybe after the lawyers cut? Yeah, that certainly isn't the spirit of Jesus' words. In fact, the organization is in this situation in the first place because they remain stubbornly stiff-necked and refuse to follow Jesus' words that we just read at Matthew 5, 21 to 26. I bet 99% of these court cases wouldn't even exist in the first place if they repented and showed works that befit repentance by changing policy for the betterment of the sheep, instead of just dancing around legalities. So, David Splain mentioning the Mosaic Law in regard to Jesus' words at Matthew 5, 25, and saying that those verses actually apply to Gentile secular courts, is either woefully ignorant of the social structure in Jesus' day, or he is completely misrepresenting Jesus' words so he can manipulate his listeners into misleadingly defending their actions with the scripture. Or both. I guess you can decide. I think that's enough for now. Maybe we can add, a, we'll add another car video on the end of this for fun. Every little boy's dream. A lot of little boy's dreams, I should say. Our tire's flat. Two of them are. It's, it's going around slow. <laughs> That's our noon bell. <laughs> That's pretty funny. It's just not very fast. Well, it's not going to be fast. Is it lit up? Well, it's hard to tell because the sun is hitting it. I think it's on, yeah. You'd think that was coincidental. Those sirens. <laughs> Funny enough, when there is an emergency, like a fire, those sirens go off, but they, they like pulse. Okay, I'm gonna shut this off. Maybe he doesn't want cables. You're gonna you're gonna alert all of the fire department if you don't quit it. This one and that one operates it. You can do it from both sides. No, don't. Okay. Stop. He's <laughs> such a little kid. Gotta check and make sure everything works. I don't know why it... Uh... It's in great shape. Do you, did you um, show video of the inside? No, I haven't done anything. 
Do you want to show how clean it is? It's pretty nice. That's the thing about fire trucks is they are always like no miles. This one's got, I think, 12,000 on it. So they're always pretty pristine. The steering wheels like has one crack in it, I think, right there. But other than that, most everything's pretty good. And what year is this thing? 61 to 66. I, I don't think know it's yet. I think it's a 66. That's not the VIN. This is the VIN, but you can't tell nothing on a VIN from the trucks. Shouldn't do that anyway. It's a 65. No, it's not. It you says F5. It does, and that doesn't mean anything. Oh, really? Yep, that's what I'm telling you. On trucks. That's F5 means it's an F500. It's not well, the year like a car. Weird. How would you figure out a year? I don't know. That's the problem. That's the big problem. Serial number. Well, that says date on there, but it says motorized fire apparatus, so I assume that's when they installed all those, all that when equipment. Was that? It was January of 66. Mm -hmm. I would assume that this would be um, a fire truck, like, right away. You know, wouldn't be building from something else, so I would assume a 60, 66, 65. Run me over jumpers. You want me to back up then and yep. put it on? Yep, let's see if we can get the thing to turn. It's not a fire enough. Come on up here. <clears throat> First start up here. You're still in neutral, right? Oh, look at that carb. Look how clean that is. So Everything the, is uh, really clean. The solenoid is out, obviously, so let's just see if it'll fire. We'll just short it across. Oh, come on now. You need a new solenoid. should go be a dead short. Down there, that's the problem. On the starter, what? Yep. <laughs> Is that key on? I don't know. I thought you told me to shut it off, so. It is off. It's you, still fired? You want it on? Yeah. It's on. Weird. All right. It needs gas. It's... How long electrical. was it sitting there? Do you I don't know? know, but it's electrical. I don't think that switch is reading on. I, I'm surprised it fired at all, mm. quite honestly. Okay. 
everything works on it. It definitely runs, but I don't know why it's not. I, I don't know why the ignition is not showing that it's. It might just be a loose connection somewhere or something. Try to start it from inside again. Okay. hard to get up here just because where it's parked on the trailer. Ready? Yep. There's nothing. No switch. Here it is, see? The wipers want to work. How about the uh, heater? The wipers were just on. Um, heater. Yeah? It's like the switch is not working. It's like a starter. You said it was a loose starter? Well, the starter's loose, but that wouldn't stop it from, from at least clicking a solenoid or putting mm. some power to the solenoid. All right. So we've got a little barn find here. It's like a 67 or 68. Ambulance. Definitely doesn't focus very well. See. Well, let's see if we can get her moved out. Okay, well, I got the flashlight to work on this. Fuzzy it'll be, but I should look at that side. Should be original mileage. Steering wheel doesn't have a crack in it. See, it looks good. I wonder when it was painted.
fired right up once I got the battery in there. A little boo boo to buff out. Tune up and be good to go.